Uh, my name is Larry Olman. I am the uh, director of the consortium, uh, and uh, am delighted to uh, have this opportunity to welcome all of you to our 45th year of uh, annual convocation. Uh, we want to welcome our guests this evening. who are involved in uh, immigration issues. Uh, I'm here to learn more, and uh, we are um, very uh, thrilled to have our speaker and panel tonight, who we will introduce further. Um, if you uh, would join me, I would like to uh, uh, open us in prayer. Holy One, we are grateful for the fullness of your grace, the richness and truth of your justice, the unbounded nature of your love. We pray this time for those who have been victims of gun violence or the recent slaying of nearly 60 and for their families or nearly 500 casualties in Nevada. Bring us to our senses, Lord, about weapons and guns and violence bind those of goodwill together to work in your name for greater paths of peace. We pray this night for each of the institutions in the Washington Theological Consortium. Fill them with your spirit, with vibrancy of learning, animate their students, to do their assignments, to ask questions, to catch the bug of uh, a discipline or a vocation. We ask your blessing on all of those who work for and with immigrants in our society, those who are on the front lines and know the costs of decisions made by the powers of the Help us to reach out from our own situations of work or teaching or ministry to link arms with those beyond our own spheres so that we can strengthen our ability to fulfill your will. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. I'd like to um, ask the um, chair of our board of trustees, uh, Mr. George Handy, to bring greetings from the board. Distinguished speakers for our panel and the event this evening, faculty for the member institutions, of the Washington Theological Consortium and guests, welcome. It's a privilege for me to welcome you to this special event and uh, also on the occasion of the convocation of faculties in support of the Washington Theological Consortium's purposes. My welcome is on behalf of the Board of Trustees and uh, the board would like to assure all faculty members that uh, you have our support for your actions during the year ahead to advance humanism and the interfaith dialogue through your teachings. This evening has some real promise for insights and for uh, challenges that I'm sure we all welcome, and particularly for the faculty as important inputs to the program that the uh, institution students will receive through the year. We're particularly pleased that uh, former Chair Jack Beagle has organized the recording uh, of this event in a way that will spread the thoughts and ideas that you contribute across the consortium in a very real and meaningful way. 
I'd like to conclude by saying thanks and congratulations to Larry and the staff for organizing this event with the support of the Council of Teams. It looks forward to be a great evening and I'm privileged to be here. Thank you, George. Uh, this event is uh, planned annually, and uh, um, the design um, uh, working closely with our office to uh, develop the faculty's communication. Uh, the event is uh, planned by the Council of Deans. We're fortunate to have uh, a good number of deans here this evening. They will be joining uh, faculty interest groups with you in their own uh, faculty specialty later on. The flow of the evening will be, um, we will have a presentation by Dr. Pham, we will have a panel responses and conversation, and we'll open it up to the floor for further conversation. We'll have uh, uh, about a half hour of faculty groups this evening uh, to brainstorm together an event or um, uh, faculty development experience that you would like to plan. Uh, we do have some money for that uh, early. Uh, Requests get more money than later requests end to end. And um, we uh, now are, um, afterwards, there'll be a full reception uh, with lots of good food here. So uh, if you have not had dinner, um, grab a grocery store bar and um, we will uh, be rewarded tonight with great food. I'd like now to uh, invite uh, Dr. Melody Nobles, uh, the uh, dean, uh, Associate Dean of Academic Affairs uh, at Virginia Theological Seminary to bring you greetings. Well, as an academic dean, I speak on behalf of all the academic deans. I know it's partially our responsibilities to keep all the faculty engaged and busy, so it's a particular pleasure to ask to have you come out tonight and support this event and to take in this very special part of the consortium. Whenever we have potential faculty hires or potential students, I always say a distinctive feature that we offer as Virginia Seminary's membership in this consortium. It really is an extraordinary gift. And I'm so grateful for all the work that you do, Larry, to make this happen, and uh, to meet you all again here tonight. Um, at the consortium, I meet mean, people who I've been reading for years. Um, Bruce Birch, who are you? Matt, I've been reading your work for years, and I've only met you here tonight. And, um, and he's filling in as an academic dean at Wesley, and um, just to hear all your good ideas, which I'm stealing every single one. Uh, that's a, also a special gift to the consortium, so it's a pleasure. You always know it's an important event, an important speaker, when you get no less than five introductions. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. But I'll let the next person in line introduce you, Dr. Diane, here. You're going to introduce Diane here. Uh, I just want to say a word about Diane before she comes. Thank you, Melody. Um, and the academic dean is your proper title. I'm sorry, not associate dean. Y'all have so many deans in this yes. I think that was it. It's like that, like that national commercial. Doctor, 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 dean, dean, dean. Um, the uh, special opportunity tonight to uh, and have Dr. Diane Yeager, who is the uh, Thomas J. Peter family, uh, distinguished professor in ethical studies at Georgetown to introduce our distinguished speaker. Um, knowing uh, Dr. Fan uh, as a colleague, uh, knowing some of his work, she will now introduce uh, him, and we're grateful to see Diane back again. She has served as a, uh, a chair member of our board of trustees, and she's a wonderful support at the consortium. So, Dr. Uh, For a person like Peter Van, it's hard to know what to hold up by way of introduction, particularly since he is well known to many of you, uh, particularly those at Catholic, the Catholic University of America, which was his academic home from 1988 to 2003, and Virginia Theological Seminary, where he received an honorary doctorate just this past May. But we might start with big data. We talk about big data a lot at Georgetown. So in that category, I could mention his 14 monographs multiplied many times by translation into at least 10 languages. 
his 17 edited collections, his 68 plus chapters in books, even if 68 plus, because I'm working with a CD. I did these totals on a CD that is at least four months old. So there may be a lot more that I learned when the CD was printed up. Uh, 68 plus chapters of books, 106 plus scholarly articles, 35 plus as you find encyclopedia articles, 30 plus special issues of journals that he has edited, his three bachelor's degrees, his three doctoral degrees, in addition to his licensure, and not counting his honorary degrees. The two new chairs that he has held, the three multi-volume book series he has edited, the two departments he has chaired, and the two doctoral programs that he has directed. That's Peter's big data. <laughs> but perhaps you're not impressed by big data. <laughs> so particularly in light of this topic tonight, I might pull up some facts about his personal story. Without denying the cosmopolitan dimension of his first 30 years, I want to acknowledge that he was forced in 1975 to leave Vietnam, and in his most recent book, The Joy of Religious Pluralism, he describes it this way, that he was forced to leave Vietnam with little more than a half an hour to gather all his earthly possessions, and with literally nothing but a shirt on my back. So again, without know, denying the cosmopolitan dimension of the years prior to that, we do want to say that Peter knows in the flesh, as it were, what it is to be a refugee and a stranger. He knows what the life of a foreigner and an immigrant is actually like in a way that many of us do not. This experience of this young professor at Salesian College in Bolotnia at Momo left an indelible mark on his subsequent life and works. Again, in the joy of religious pluralism, he suggests that the result is this. Temperamentally, I am too much a fatalist, I'm quoting here. Uh, temperamentally, I am too much a fatalist to be shocked by personal tragedies. Bad things just happen, and you have to take them in stride. My favorite philosophy of life is, it could have been worse. <laughs> Compared to my past ordeals, any current troubles are little more than skin deep scratches. So the recent volumes that Peter has edited with Elaine Padilla on immigration matters, uh, the three volumes, 2013, 2014, 2016, on uh, immigration matters, are more than detached scholarly investigations. They have roots that run right down to the roots of his own personal experience. The cultural diversity and boundary crossings have provided a thematic base note in other ways, in addition to his attention to immigration issues. Uh, they show up as well as he examines the mission and core identity of the church. Listen to the titles of some of the books. The Mission of God, In Our Own Tongues, Perspectives from Asia on Mission and Inculturation. Christianity with an Asian face. Being religious interreligiously. That's the one that there was some trouble about. Catholic Christianities in Asia, and finally, most recently, I think most recently, you haven't done another one. <laughs> in addition, uh, The Joy of Religious Pluralism, a book in which he undertakes to clear up the ambiguities and confusions which the church authorities complain to have found in being religious, interreligiously. So, Peter knows firsthand that Christianity is a global religion, and one of those multi volume series, 25 volumes, as a matter of fact, that he edited is called the series in theology, Theology and Global Perspective, all of the volumes published by Orbis. And as a global religion, Christianity necessarily shares cultural space with other global faiths. This represents a tremendous opportunity in an age of global problems because these global religious communities can function as transnational actors, a fact which really 
in my view, has the potentiality to alter our understanding of the mission. At the same time, being a world church raises important challenges. When religion is framed and consolidated in one social, political, intellectual, and linguistic context, but then instantiated in quite different cultural contexts, where it is the center? And what does center even mean? Where, indeed, are the boundaries? And what sort of witness is appropriate at those boundaries? So Peter's experience and his work precipitate us directly into the reality of the complex living religion Christianity is today. I do commend to you the joy of religious pluralism. There are just three things I'd like to mention about that most recent book. The first is it begins in anger. Until I opened that book, if people had said, what one word best describes Peter Fan, I would have said, affable. So I was quite taken aback that that book begins in anger. And beware the anger of an affable man. <laughs> but it's important to notice it was not anger on Peter's own behalf, but on behalf of his family who, in his view, of being caused needless pain and distress. It was anger over a perceived injustice, reminding us all, in case we might have forgotten, that Peter's very first book concerned Catholic social thought. He had come to a point in 2004, 2005, when he thought that he was being asked to be complicit with injustice, something that he was not willing to do by his own work. And this, too, is a reminder to all of us who are involved in one way or another with churches that these institutions, too, are capable of injustice, disregard, and dehumanization, and that they must be held to account, not necessarily by public fuss, but by small acts of determined <coughs> integrity. The second thing I'd like to mention about the most recent book is he exhibits there his own wry, pointed, but puckish irreverence as he writes that he wishes, he came to wish he had written all his books in Vietnamese, since that would surely have spared him any troublesome scrutiny by the church authorities. And he reports that he had considered composing all his correspondence to church authorities in his mother tongue, asking, why should I write in the language of the powerful? Well, he answers his own question, because he had no wish to be accused of obfuscation and prevarication by writing in the And lastly, there is in the joy of religious pluralism a kind of to me touching regard for and trust in the simple, faithful, and the census fidelium. It is right and proper, he writes, that we should care deeply about matters of faith and the well-being of the church. No disagreement there with the church authorities. The question for a for church leaders and indeed for the whole global church in a troubled and fissured world is how best to do that. How best to care deeply for matters of faith or the well-being of the church. And certainly exploring this challenge has in fact been Peter's own career-long mission and witness. Please welcome George Thomas Pinocchio of Korea, Professor of Catholic Social Law. Right? And he saw the light, so he left a quick Georgetown and walked to the rest of the 
I'm very happy to share this with three other scholars. Dr. John Ann, uh, who's an Old Testament scholar, who has did a book, edited a book on forced migration. I also share the uh, panel with Dr. Sam Maruyo, right? who's a sociologist. And then finally, I also share the uh, panel with Andrea, Catherine Doe. So, whatever I say today will be elaborated and added on by the three of them. My written text is about um, 18 pages, double space. So, if I read as slowly as our President Trump, <laughs> I can finish in about 40 minutes, 35, 40 minutes. So, that's the time assigned to me. <laughs> The haunting images of a three-year-old Syrian boy, Alan Shin, wash up face down on a beach in Turkey in his red shirt, blue shorts, and black shoes. And of a one-year-old drowned baby cradled in the arms of a German rescuer had drawn all my attention to the problem of migration. And today, because of flood in Puerto Rico, flood in um, Florida, flood in Houston, the question of migration is not only simply international migration, but within our country, that people start moving. And so migration today, even if it is Call to our mind that like this very tragic event, war in Syria, war in the Middle East, and in, in Syria, all that makes it so real to us as we face natural disasters. Even though it is not caused by war and so forth, but still natural disaster is one of the causes of people movement. Of course, there are questions of forced migration, as uh, Dr. I will tell you about that, but if you just simply leave it to the question of migration as refugees, we will narrow ourselves to a very small slice, although it's very attractive, but still very small slice of our situation of migration today. On the other hand, as American citizens, we saw with our own minds the president who signed an executive decree banning the common Muslims from many six, seven countries, and with great hilarity show up to the people as if this is the greatest achievement of the United States, force us to ask the question, are we to laugh or are we to cry? What must I do as a Christian? What is the reaction of us if we talk about strength, no longer strangers and foreigners, how can we tolerate that sort of official uh, policy that discriminates against people of different faith, different ethnicities, different languages? What can we do? And that is the question that I'd like to uh, reflect on this evening with you by looking at basically three the first one that we all know, and that is always among us here, is what does migration have to do with the church? How do we teach church history? We have very distinguished church historian among us. How do we teach church history? Is migration an accident that happened to the church a long 2,000 years of history? It is something that just happened now and then, the cycle of history caused by flood, by natural disasters, by war. Or is migration a constitutive dimension of the Christian church? In other words, I'd like to show you tonight 
very quickly that we have migration, there is no church at all. Extra migration, null migration. And that belongs to the very essence of the church, and not just accidental history that causes it to happen, but the very nature of the church without the migrant and migration, there is no Christian church at all, historically and theologically. That's my first thesis. My second thesis follows. If there is no church without migration, and if there is no salvation without the church, Aristotelological conclude there is no salvation outside migration. <laughs> Now that's harder to show, but I'm going to show you tonight that extra migration nulla salves. There's no salvation outside of migration. That forced me to go back beyond the questions of historical constitution of the church, go back to the very depth, the deepest mystery of the Christian the faith, the dignity itself. Can we say that without migration, there is no presence of the Trinity in our history, the economic Trinity. And the third is the question of ethics. How do we deal with the issues of migration? So there are ethics, I see there right here, like we will see that. So the question of ethics, we talked about hospitality, we talked about welcome. Is there something else that we need to talk about? Now we know the Bible talks about migration, welcome the strangers, the widows, the orphans, the foreigners. But that I, I suggest that is another aspect of ethical questions that we rarely mention because it is not very pleasant to mention. So first of all, the question of church is a constitution, a constituted migration. This is true of the Catholic Church, of course, those of us who this Catholic Church know very well that Catholics, the uh, American Catholic Church, exists because of the comings of man. Particularly, they were Catholic before the coming of the man, no doubt about that. Uh, the, the native uh, Mexican who were here before, they were Catholic, so they were the Catholics before the coming of the Irish. Germans, Catholic, the East Europeans, and the Italian. But the Catholic Church, American Catholic Church is truly church as, a, as an organization with all its uh, hierarchical and, and institutional aspects, exists only with the coming of the Catholic migrant from Europe. This is a historical fact, and many of you are no better than I do about this. When Pope Francis came to the United States several years ago, on the lawn of the White House, he gave a little talk. And he said, as a migrant, a Jew, as a child of migrants, I am very, very welcome into a country that is constituted by migrants. We remember well that speech he gave. But more than that, he should have that, he could have that, when he was to write a paper speech. Right? <laughs> and as a migrant, I step into a church that is constituted by migrants. Without migrants, there is no American Catholic Church. But this is something uh, uh, that we, we, we know for a fact. But what about the church in general? When we read books on church history, when, I don't know whether anybody do teach church history here, there, there are one, anyone else do teach church history, you know, and usually we have two courses on church history, you know, patristic, medieval, and then the renaissance, the modern, and you know, we skip the reformation because that's not very important, right? <laughs> <laughs> Why in the world we make the Reformation important though it is the central piece of our relationship among the so-called denomination of the Bible? I often joke 
I know, some, with some truth, that the Reformation is a family quarrel among Western Christians. Why do I import that story into Asia, to Africa, and make it the centerpiece of our relation to the churches? Why? It is a new centric, Western centric vision of church history. Rather, I suggest to you that if you really want to understand the movement of church history as a whole, make migration the centerpiece of your rewriting of church history. Here it is. I'd like to present a migratory movement that constitute Christianity as it is. The first one is, of course, a migration that is, uh, came out of uh, uh, the, uh, Jerusalem, or the Jewish diaspora, in the destruction of the Second Temple in the year 870. That is the first migration out of, without that migration, there is no Christian church. Christianity would probably remain a Jewish sect. That's all. Interesting about the Jewish sect. But because of migration, then Christianity emerged as something different from Judaism. The second migration is the migration of Christianity from Jerusalem up to the Syria, Damascus, especially after the Jewish revolt of 115-117. 122 to 135. It causes the migration not only of Jews but also of Christians. And imagine this the spreading in the five, the destination, five areas of early Christianity. And eventually Alexandria, Antioch, Rome, and so forth. You have a spreading of Christianity. Remember that the first Christians migrated not only to the West, but the so-called to the East. East meaning East Syria, Mesopotamia, the cradle of early Christianity, Baghdad, from Baghdad to Afghanistan, the so-called Central Asia, following the Silk Road, way to India and to China. That is migration. That is what makes the church the migration. Of, not by popes, not by bishops, not by priests. <laughs> by the lay people, the merchants. The gospel was preached not by hierarchies, but by gossiping the gospel. The gospel was gossiped by the people of the way. Without this movement of merchants and, and, and traders and so forth, and then the bishops had come along later on. But it was these people, these migrants, because of trade, so they were these migrants that founded the church along the way, all the way to China, India and then to China. The third migratory movement is, of course, the move, the move of by Constantine from Rome to Byzantium. Imagine you move the capital and move it all, the shifting of the gravity of Christianity in the fourth century from Rome to Byzantium. And you have a new form of Christianity, Byzantine Christianity. Again, it is a migration. That a woman, imagine Rome say tomorrow, let's move Rome to God forbid, down the steps. <laughs> oh, now still New Jersey. All right. Watch out. We're meddling now. If you uh, be careful now. There's some two New Jersey people. But imagine, imagine the kind of Christianity that we transform by this move. Imagine Bishop Carroll in Rome and say, I have to bring my nephews along with me. <laughs> Their wives, no, not one. <laughs> but imagine that, there's a whole movement. 
It does not matter of just the doctrine, it's a whole shift at the center of gravity of Christianity from the Roman kind of Christianity to the Greek or Byzantine Christianity. The fourth movement, the movement of the German tribes from Northern Europe to the South. That again is a new Christianity that moved in now. The gods, the Visigoths, the Christianity that come is not the so-called Orthodox Christianity, but Aryan Christianity. They come down to Spain, from Spain to Africa, to, come, uh, to, to the city of people where uh, uh, Augustine was dying, they died in bed. That was Christianity, and a whole Christianity that's different from the Byzantine Christianity, the Roman Christianity, because of migration of these people. The fifth migration is the discovery of the new world. I mean, 1452. You have opened the entire, these mind, they were migrants. They were not primarily missionaries. They were people who were looking for new land, new, new, new wealth, and so forth. Well, the Franciscans and the many came along. But it was the migration of these people that transformed the nature of Christianity in the 15th century. The so-called discovery of the new world. We're under Spain and Portugal part of the system. They're a whole different kind. If, you, if, if we rewrite your history and do not make certain ecclesiastical events as the center, but take secular events, the different way we look at the The next is the migration caused by the First World War. Huge. 1914-1918. And, and the modernization and industrialization in the world economy and then the people think, think of how many millions of Christian soldiers, right? Moving from, from country to country and so forth. The next is World War II. Amazing the number, if you look at the number of Europeans who moved to Asia and Africa for war, for business, and after the World War II, these people come back to Europe with their own families. The reverse migration, the migration of Europeans to South America, the migration of European to Asia and then to Africa in the 19th century. Now, after the Second World War, these Christians come back to Europe to create a new type of Christianity. And finally, of course, the eighth movement is out in the age of globalization. Time is compressed, space is reduced. We can now be anywhere, any day in 15, 20 hours. We are reminded by a person who is not island, surrounded by ocean water. <laughs> what does it do this call? <laughs> and now, migration of the Puerto Rican to Florida. With all the implications of politics, economy, Imagine the next national presidential election. Florida with the majority of voters who come from Puerto Rico. Mm. It will be as blue as the red you can find. <laughs> <laughs> That's why politically it's better to keep them there rather than here. Mm. So you see then, for us to revisit church history, to think through church history for the perspective of migration, lens of migration, lens of new insights into what it is to be church, what it is to be a Christian community. That the migrants are not strangers and foreigners anymore. They are not foreign. They are who we are. 
We are the mind boys. And not simply they are the mind that come to our What is home? What is home? Now, those of us who, who, who are not born here, you know, we, we are constantly faced with the problem. You, you look different. You talk different. You dress different. But that's what we were at the beginning. That's what the parents, grandparents of Donald Trump from Germany, no less. Right? And somehow now today they present themselves as native. By what right? Who are the native of the world foreigners? And that begins shaping our vision of churches. That second point, I go to put the second point. So outside of migration, there is no church, no Christianity. But more than that, outside of migration, there is no salvation. Hmm. That is a theological statement. The first one is a more a historical statement. You can dispute that. Okay? But for me, it is more than a historical accident. It is the very nature of God, who God is. And the new name that I gave to God is Deus Nicrapo. <laughs> and, and the God who is the Michael of excellence. Um, Dr. Adam will talk about this in the Old Testament. He will talk about that. But for me, God in the act of creation, we, we, we can talk about the imminent trinity. You can speculate whatever you want to talk about relation to know that there is a form to do it. But we can talk about God as present in history, the so-called economic trinity. The first act is the act of creation. And what does creation mean? It is not the act of power. It's the act of witness. God got out of God said to be something other than God. What is that? If not, that's a Michael. The Michael leaves his or her home to go to another home, become something else <coughs> other than who he is. A Mexican who come to the United States, a Vietnamese, a Korean, or whoever, a Japanese, they leave their home and come here and be other in other places, facing the fragility, the, the, uh, the, 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 the worry and the care, the concern. Is not what God does in the act of creation. To be other than who God is. And to face the insecurity of facing the other who is humanity and the cosmos, and facing the rejection of this new home that he comes in, creation itself. Although, as the Gospel of John the Prophet says, it's light, but darkness rejects. And so the fate of God in creation is the fate of a migrant moving from his homeland to a new land where he faces all kinds of uh, uh. Second, the word of God in incarnation. The incarnation for me is migration paradigmatic case. It's a paradigmatic case of migration. If God is the day of the Miracle. Jesus is the Michael par excellence. I don't need to go into all the long ministry of Jesus to discuss uh, to, to talk about it. I just mentioned a few few things. Jesus, the word of God, the incarnation of the word of God in Jesus of Nazareth, can likewise be regarded as God my Torino. It is the telos and the combination of God's first migration, which is creation, as the new Scottish would tell us. In this migration to history, as a Jew in the land of Palestine, God, like a human migrant, entered a far country where God, as part of the colonized nation, encounters people of different racial, ethnic, and national background. 
with strange languages, unfamiliar customs, foreign cultures, and like a migrant after a life from the journey, pitch the tent. John 14, pitch the tent or Tathamoto among us. And then when Jesus performed a ministry, uh, he just like a man, never have a word someone to lay his head. He walked, he eat, he traveled, everyone never have a home, a mind and wholeness, literally. And then you have the sense of how Jesus can understand the people without country, without nationality, without dignity. And then, because he is a migrant, he faced the hardships of hunger and thirst and sickness and loneliness and everything else that we face in his life. And that's why in his many parables, he presents the kingdom of God as a banquet to which all are welcome, especially for the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Luke 14, 21. And when he died, he dies outside the city. Let the Hebrew say, outside the city gate and outside the camp. But even in death, Jesus did not remain within the boundaries of what death means. Failure, defeat, destruction. By his resurrection, he crossed the boundaries, the borders of death into a new life. Thus bringing hope where there is despair, victory where there is defeat, freedom where there is slavery, and life where there is death. Isn't that what migrants look for all of the world? Father, the Holy Spirit, so God the Father, mighty for excellent, death and battle, the Son of the Word of God entered into the world, become the public mind. What is the Holy Spirit that has to do with it? As you know, in migration, there is the poor and the push. At this one we understand. The poor are hope, a better life for me and for my children and so forth, and the push from behind the push. I would say the Holy Spirit represents that energy that push here the courage, the trust, and the pull. And what the, from the Christian perspective, it is the kingdom of God if the Holy Spirit is identified with the coming of the kingdom of God. It is the Holy Spirit therefore represents the push and the pull of migration, gave the migration courage to say, we will move on. We are not dwelling in this place. And finally, the church. The church is a community of migrants. Now, this is easily understood, as I said in the first part, but what I am concerned about when they talk about the church as a community of migrants, it is understood in the eschatological sense. Right? And that is a problem. It becomes so abstract. Yeah, we church, we move towards, no, 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 no. I mean the church, a community of migrants in blood, flesh, and blood. And that is the church and its community of migrants. Not simply someone, the people of God, marching towards the kingdom of God. This is the kind of vision we find in the doctrine of Vatican II or the church room in Genesis chapter 8. For me, that's a job, chapter 7. That's okay, but it doesn't tell me anything. It's when I see the church is composed of people who come from elsewhere who belong to this part of the community, then I would say that the church is right. I conclude with ethics. What kind of ethics? How do we treat one another? Uh, the Bible talks about welcoming, uh, hospitality. Right? I like, I accept all that. But there is another aspect of ethics that I like to draw your attention. The ethics of memory. The ethics of memory of the migrants. Why? Because there's strong danger on both on a migrant to forget the past, 
because directly you don't want to remember where you come from. And the pressure of the country, remember you are no longer a migrant, you are a man of a citizen. And that is the nature. What you see yourself as a migrant, you forget the memory where you come from, then you become the oppressor. You become, I am the native, the new one and the foreigners. This is the history of every community of mine. Those who come first, succeed, climb the ladder, and those who come after to get the ladder so that the other can come up. And this happened, the Vietnamese do the same thing, those who arrived in 1975, look down upon those who come in 1985, 10 years later, they are not in, because now I become an American citizen. With all the privileges and the rights and the power that belong to me as an American citizen, because I forget where I come from. So the essence of memory, memory where you come from, the pain, the suffering, and the, the struggle that you, we part with us, we cannot forget and say, now I become a citizen of the United States, and now I act as a citizen. We are never citizens, we are always a mind. And better still, a coal The migrant is a person in and through whom I can discover my true identity. That is who I am. A migrant, better still, a coal migrant with Jesus, a enigmatic migrant, and all the fellow migrants energized by the push and pull of the Holy Spirit on our migration, on our migration back to the eternal home of the Thank you.